All right, welcome back, guys. We're going to start talking about what the force is that causes things to go in a circle. And before we do, we're going to talk about what the force isn't. And what the force isn't is centrifugal. Imagine that we're in a bus together and I'm driving you somewhere. And you guys aren't paying attention. We're going down Pleasant Valley at a nice 35 miles per hour. All of a sudden, I decide I'm going to play a little trick on you with this physics demonstration. And I turn the wheel really hard. What happens to you? Yeah, you smash into the window or smash into the person next to you. Now, in that non-inertial reference frame, you think something pushed you against the window. Something pushed you against the person next to you. That's not what happened. What happened was you were moving in a straight line, and when I turned, you kept on moving in a straight line until a net force turned you, whether it was the person sitting next to you or the window. That's inertia. An object in straight line motion tends to stay in straight line motion. This is the centrifugal force. Centrifugal is fictional. It has an F, just like fictional. Anything that's moving wants to remain in straight line motion. It is made up, like Baba Yaga, Bigfoot, or his Asian cousin, the Yeti. Examples of this. You're slammed into a car when a car makes a sudden turn. You've ever washed clothes. When you open it up, all the clothes are stuck to the outside. Nothing threw them to the outside. They kept on wanting to go straight, and they couldn't. Guess what could? The water. So when it's spun around, there's little holes in there, and the water could go out, and it dries your clothes a good amount so that they're not soaking wet. The same thing with a centrifuge. So spinning it around, things want to go in a straight line, and it'll separate them. All right, so circular motion is going to require a net force painting, pointing towards the center. And this is going to be our centripetal force. So we had F net equals zero. When we had constant speed, or at rest, we had F net equals MA. We had things speed up or slow, and now we're going to have a new F net, but instead of MA, it's MAC. And if we remember what AC is, it's V squared over R. So now F net equals MV squared over R, and this is going to be when objects change direction. And since our acceleration is towards the center, our force has to be towards the center. So here is a ball being spun around, similar to a bee on a string. The force on it is towards the center. The acceleration is towards the center, which is Greek for, or in Greek is centripetal. The velocity is tangential. And so we have a new F net, our third F net, which is going to be mv squared over r. We see this all the time. This is what keeps uh, planets in orbit. This is what keeps the moon going around us. This is what keeps satellites going around the Earth. This is how your car turns. Your car, when it turns, wants to keep on going in a straight line. The friction of the tires points towards the center of whatever circle you're turning in and turns you. You can also have normal pushing like that. If you've ever seen a banked curve, so part of the surface is going towards the center, that'll also push you. The normal and a weight on a roller coaster during a loop. So here is an object in a car that is turning, and we can see the net force is towards the center. So that means that the frictional force of each of these individual tires is pointing towards the center, wherever it is. And 
And we can see in this diagram as well. So the friction. And again, that's why when we talked about coefficient of friction, like tires are usually about one. It's about as hard usually to drag a tire as it is to lift it because you don't want it to slip. It's you want to have friction. We can see in this picture, if there isn't enough, you'll keep on going in a straight line. You can actually see that when the cars were going fast enough, you can see the lines where it went straight. So the car, the car doesn't like kind of make it around the turn. It doesn't make it at all. Once it starts slipping, it goes in a straight line. Why? Because when it's rolling, it's static friction going towards the center. As soon as it starts slipping, it's kinetic, and that's less. So once it starts moving, it's easier for it, and you're not going to get it back. You're not going to get it back. That's how anti-lock brakes work. The idea of anti-lock brakes, if you haven't experienced them yet, you'll be... It'll be quite an experience because you'll think something's wrong with your car. You're pressing the brakes and you feel a bop, 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 bop on the bottom of your foot over and over again. Why is it doing that? Because static is always more than kinetic. So once you start sliding, your, your car realizes that and it stops at sliding. It lets the wheel roll again. And then once it slides again, it does the same thing. And that's where you feel it over and over again because it's sliding, not sliding, sliding, not sliding because they want to be rolling. And since static is more than kinetic, we have anti-lock brakes. So as long as the tires do not slip, the friction is static. If the tires do start to slip, the friction is kinetic, which is always less. So it's going to be very hard for us to regain control, and it explains why it's anti-lock brakes. It's going to make it... Pump it so it starts rolling again and get the static back. And again, here's an example of a banking of a curve. So part of the normal, the normal times the sine of the angle is actually going towards the center. And so is friction. But you could have something banked with no friction at all and it still would be able to slide. Or it would be able to turn with no friction at all just with the normal force.